Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the um, seventh talk in the 2024 Winter Speaker Series. Uh, glad to see a, a nice crowd this evening. Uh, my name is Mark Edwards, and I'm going to be the MC tonight. Um, this is actually our 19th year of doing these talks, which kind of surprises me because I've been a member of the club for 20 years and didn't realize it had gone on that long. Um, so part of the reason for holding these talks is, you know, besides the obvious of uh, having something to do while we're waiting for the river to thaw, and if, if you looked out today, you'll notice the river is actually thawed, but we're waiting for the harbor to, to clear, um, is to raise a bit of money for the legacy fund. So the legacy fund um, basically helps us give money to uh, people that are, are passionate about sailing uh, and supports uh, activities for youth sailors, able sailing, and uh, disadvantaged youth. So uh, we're hoping to raise about $2,000 this year. Uh, we're just over halfway there. And so we're hoping we, you can make a donation tonight to help us to our goal. And Mark at the back will be walking around with a, a beer jug uh, asking for your donations. Um, these uh, winter speaker series are all done uh, by volunteers, you know, the speakers, myself, uh, the technical crew, the people organizing the, uh, the schedule, uh, putting together the, uh, the presentations that get posted on the web and everything. So uh, just like to thank a few of the people. Um, so there's myself, Mark Rand, uh, Ron Evans, Richard Kellen, Jeff Delaney, Floyd Puschelberg, and Stephen Kidd, who's the uh, director of PR for the club and has put a lot of effort into this as well. So uh, Ottawa is actually blessed to have a very wide boating community. You know, there's, there's the, the main clubs of Aylmer, Britannia, Nepean, uh, but there's also the, you know, Lac de Chien, um, Ottawa New Edinburgh Club, the Rockcliffe Yacht Club, and just, you know, show of hands, if you're not from the NSC, can you just raise your hand? Anybody? One from Britannia, I know. No? Th three, three visitors tonight. Welcome. Hope you come back. Um, these talks actually run until about the 10th of April when everybody's going to be focused on uh, getting their boats ready to go in the water, so we, we stop the talks at that point. Um, Next week, we have a, an interesting talk about a voyage uh, called the Voyage of Discovery, uh, about a, a fellow and his crew who picked up a boat in Granada and then fix it up and sail it through to Newfoundland. And the week after that, we have the story of an Atlantic crossing. So uh, hopefully that'll be of interest to people here and, and you come back and join us. So we, we have three speakers tonight, um, Mike Roper, uh, Lenore Evans and Tony Lattice, who's in the crowd here. Um, so Mike apparently has been racing on Lac de Chain for over 30 years uh, and 13 years of a as a skipper of a CNC 27 XL. Jala. Uh, okay, what does that mean? Uh, means place of quiet waters. Ah, place of quiet waters. Um, he's also the NSC fleet training coordinator and uh, runs the annual keelboat um, race practice. Sorry, I'm just going to pull the mic here for a sec so I can see better. Um, he's also uh, a Sail Canada basic and intermediate cruising instructor. Lenore Evans uh, learned to sail only three years ago uh, as an avid albacore racer and has learned that time on the water is the only way to improve sailing skills. You, you, you can't read a book on it. Uh, Lenore organizes an eight-week dinghy skill training session for adults in a collaborative and community-minded atmosphere. And Tony started racing dinghies at the age of 12 in uh, Calgary, so that was what, three weeks ago? Yeah. Uh, and at 16, he represented Canada at Expo 67 World Championships, and at 17, ran an independent sailing school in a remote lake in Alberta. How many lakes are there in Alberta? Quite a few, okay. 40-year naval career in both the Royal Navy and, Royal and Canadian Navy as a navigator, deep diver, and bomb disposal expert. So no loud noises tonight, please. 
Tony's been with BYC for 12 years uh, on the sailing committee and nominated fleet captain and commodore several times. So, on with the show. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Um, Mike Roper here. So, we're here today to give a talk on how to start racing and have fun. And uh, what is what this talk is not is is not a talk to tell you how to get around the race course quickly or how to finish first. I'm certainly not an expert on finishing first. I could tell you a lot about third or fourth place, but not first. What we want to do is give you a guide as to anyone who's interested in starting to race either as skipper or crew or even join our program as a volunteer, how you can get started or how to make your way into this. So we've broken into four sections. We've got an introduction, which is like the where, what, how of racing on Lactoshen. A uh, section on what you need to do to prepare to join races in order that you will have fun when you start. Uh, a, a third section on some of the opportunities we have here at Nepean for <coughs> further learning and training, again applicable to both volunteers and uh, sailors. And then the last section is a very special section from Tony, who is out of BYC, but has developed his own race program there, which runs on Wednesday evenings, and there's be great interest to anyone who wants to, to start racing. So <coughs> before we get into the meat of it, um, we'd also, I thought it'd be nice if you hear from each of us a little bit why we think sailing is so much fun, why it's good for your mind, body, and soul. So Tony's been doing it the longest of all of us. seconds sometimes. So, uh, right, uh, where are my notes? So I wrote a few notes and I thought somebody else was going to present them, so now I've got a bunch of scrawl here. So, for me, having I've been involved in a number of sports like most of us, you know, hockey, soccer, baseball, running, this, that, and the other. I found sailing by far the most cerebral intellectual sport you could possibly get involved in. That's why it's so good for children. Uh, the young kids that are this high are out there learning like seven different things at the same time. Amazing amount of brain work going on. So that's one of the main reasons I think sailing is great. It keeps your brain active in so many different levels. Um, so, get some light here. Uh, yeah. So there's, there's many different levels of brain function that have to go on. Um, you have to understand the theory of sailing first, how do sailboats work, why do they work, what makes them stall. You have to understand aerodynamics and hydrodynamics at, a, at the beginning. And then you have to take that theory and make it work on the boat you're in, which is, for some people, very challenging. For others, it works because they've got the right kind of brain. Which brings me to the point, sailing a boat and racing particularly requires a certain kind of brain. I'm not sure what you'd typify it as, but I find that people who have engineering, mathematical, analytical brains do well at sailing. Um, not saying artists don't, but there is a tendency for the other kind of people to get it right away and they say, no, I get how that sail works and why it doesn't work like this. So it's that kind of brain. Um, in addition to getting the theory into practice, you then have to interpret this in real time on the water. So everything is moving, everything is changing all the time. So the ability to know what should be happening, what is happening, and what's going to happen soon and have all that come together and say, okay, so my plan is I'm going to change course, change my sails, do this, that, and the other. It's got to be, become second nature to you. And that's why I say you see these kids that are eight years old, they got it down pat, which is amazing, the amount of brain work going on. Um, you have to understand the racing rules of sailing, because that's like playing chess. If you don't understand the rules of chess, you're not going to do very well. It's a basic set of rules. Then you have to understand how can I use those rules to my advantage, just like any other game with rules. And in sailing, that's very much the case. You know, if you know your rules, you can say, when these three boats come together, I'm going to be here, and I will have the right of way over all of them if I do this now. But if I wait too long, I won't be able to do that. And, that kind of, that's, and that's the strategic level. Um, what else here? A couple of more things. So, do I, enough? Okay, so understand your boat, understand the theory, put the two together, and your brain will be full all the time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. 
Why is sailing fun? Um, well, I was going to actually talk about racing. Why is racing fun? Because we're here to talk about racing tonight. Um, and my uh, formula is a little bit simpler than Tony's, probably why I'm not first. <laughs> Basically, my formula is community plus challenge equals fun. So for me, being part of the racing community here at Nepean Sailing Club is a big part of of sailing and of racing and learning from each other and it's been it's been just really transformative i've only been racing now for two years but i love it and this year my goal is to not come in dfl <laughs> who knows what dfl stands for oh only two oh <laughs> i don't want to say it online <laughs> dead mm, last <laughs> Should be a trophy for <laughs> Anyway, uh, before we get started, I would just love to do a quick show of hands here. So how many people in the crowd are already sailors? Hands up. Good, good, good. Uh, how many are crew? And how many are skippers? Good. Um, how many own a boat? How many own two boats? How many own three boats? Four boats. Oh dear. <laughs> How many are already racers? Nice. Okay. How about half? Okay, that's good to know. How many are in keel boats? Okay, most. How many are in dinghies? Okay, good. Quite a few dinghies. That's great. How many learned to sail as a kid? You guys are awesome. How many learned to sail as a teenager? Like, nice. And how many learned to sail as an adult? Yes, lots of adult learners. Awesome. Um, okay, so community and challenge. challenge. Right. So for me, uh, I started racing, yeah, here and started in small boats at the Canada Sailing Club, and then made my up up here, got my own race boat, and in keel boats, and at the beginning it was all about, yeah, the challenge and going fast and competing, and now in a bigger boat with six crew, it's a lot, it's a lot about community, but community in my boat as well, so, so I think it's six people, you get to know them pretty well, you get an awful lot of unsolicited advice as a skipper, and it's added a whole, you know, extra level of enjoyment, having all these other people to share the experience with, so three different views of what sailing means to each of us, I guess, and hopefully, and not sailing, I should say racing, thank you, Leo, means to each of us it's different and it's different for everyone, but if you're interested in racing or if you want to find out how to get more into it, then hopefully there'll be something for you in this talk. So for those who don't know, Lake Duchenne is right out there. Um, it's our racing playground. <coughs> it's a very nice body of water. We can always see land, not too scary, but the main thing is we supported by two um, very uh, well-run and quite large sailing clubs that have combined for several years, many years, to run races together on this piece of water. To the point where um, on many, many occasions we have multiple, um, multiple courses, whoops, sorry about that. Slight technical problem here. Multiple races going on the course at one time. So it's divided into three. You'll see Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, if you're racing, you'll know these courses, and if you're getting into it, th this is what they mean. They're different parts of the river we can set up a course on. Um, this is where most of our weekend, weekday racing takes place. Long distance races head off to the left, up as far as Moore Island, some of them. And um, yeah, this is our playground. It's, it's a really nice piece of water, and unlike where I first learned to sail, the North Sea, it is quite often blue and warm, not cold and gray. So big improvement for me. So who goes racing? Well, you probably know many different types of people and boats can sail. Because we have a handicap system here, you don't need to be a special type of boat to race. Uh, we use something called PHRF, which is Perform Performance Handicap Racing Fleet. And it essentially assigns a, a score to each boat based on how fast it can go around a course. It's based on historical records of, uh, of many races. And the idea is that you can use that to equalize the race time so that any boat, in theory, could win a race. Uh, the dinghies, cats, and skiffs, 
the race, you use a slightly different handicap system, but it's the same principle. And um, this, you can see this, this is an example from um, a recent race last year. This is the first five boats. So the boat that came in first actually went around the course in 54 minutes. The boat that came fifth went around in 44 minutes. So almost 10 minutes faster, but because this is a very fast CNC, it's, 30, it's about 38 feet. It's 10 feet longer than this one, much faster. His handicap brought him down to fifth place with a, a, a effective time or a corrected time of 52 minutes versus 50 minutes. Uh, the other thing about this is people sometimes think that handicap racing means it's not close and exciting, but if you look at the first four boats here, they all finished within 20 seconds of each other in a, a race that took 45 minutes. So it can be very close racing indeed. Good question. What does one design mean? So these are boats that are strictly controlled in what you can do to them in terms of the hull, the sails, the mast, usually by the manufacturer or a class association. Essentially, then, all the boats in this class, these classes will be, go at the same speed. And in this case, we don't need to handicap them, and the first one over the line wins. Right now, we have uh, five, seven classes. We have J22s, 24s, and 80s, Vipers, Tans, and Sharks, and the CNC 27s. And there's uh, also an option for able sail racers to race their one design Martin 16s in 2.4 meter boats. They, they have a chance to race in the Dinky Summer Series. So, racing opportunities. There's an awful lot of racing goes on here. In fact, our fleet captain, I think, claims that this is probably the most populous area in North America for racing in terms of the number of races run and boats, and boats out racing. So we have races every weeknight except for Fridays. Tony has his rust races running on Wednesday afternoons. We have long distance races nearly every weekend through the summer and at, at the beginning and end of, this, of the season we have icebreaker and frostbite, frostbite series. Um, we also have special races. So Midnight Madness is, takes place in total darkness in August. It's truly madness when there's 20 knots of wind, but it's also fun. Uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, Jack Adams Challenge, it runs all year. It's a self-timed race. So you time when you start, you go up to the finish, to the turnaround point, and you time when you come back, and uh, that, that gets entered into the log, and the fastest boat wins. Um, turkey trot, all the boats go around chasing the turkey boat at the end of the season. And there's at least three weekend regattas run out of Nepean and a similar number of, at Britannia each year. So <coughs> that's a lot of racing going on. So. For people that are new to racing, either as crew or as skipper, where would you start? Well, um, women's races, if you're a, a women's skipper on a women's boat, you have a, a, a Monday evening all to yourselves on the river, which is nice. Um, Tony has his rust series on Wednesday afternoons, which is very accessible for new racers. If you're a dinghy sailor, you're pretty much stuck with all the other dinghy racers on Wednesdays, but I hear they're a very nice crew, so they'll look after you. And for keelboat races, uh, Thursday jam races, where there's no spinnakers involved, they are handicapped to PHRF to even the scores out. And it's a good way to, s to start. The long distance races also, which are a lot less crowded and run on the weekends through the season. So for crewing, I um, have to admit, uh, it's, 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 it's not always easy for someone who's come into this, this club, or BYC has, two, has the same issue of finding a boat to race on. Um, the turnover in, in boats tends to be quite slow. Um, if you find a boat you like, you'd like to keep racing on it. So how can you get started? Um, the first thing is to be a club member, to so be here and talk to people. You can talk to our fleet captain, you can talk to our sailing director, Sean Baden. You can talk to skippers who talk to other skippers who know who needs crew. Um, really making those contacts is really key to getting, getting in. There is a crew bank, which is like the, the formal online dating service for crews and skippers. So you can put your resume up on there. And you do need, I think, to be considered um, for, by most races some sailing experience. But something like basic cruising or the equivalent is ideal. 
And the, the other key is availability and reliability. So um, what nights are you available and can you be there you know, a reasonable number of times during the year? Uh, the other option is for sort of casual pickups. We have a, a tent here where skippers can find crew, crew can find skippers on the night of a race because quite often we find someone has to cancel at the last moment. They're sick or the baby's sick or something's happened. So those are the options, but the main, I think the main message is you have to talk to people, you have to keep asking, and hopefully you will find a, a home. Volunteering. So I think um, Mark mentioned this, but really uh, for racing, we could not race here without the volunteers, particularly in this club. Um, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes other than just showing up with your boat on the start line. So we have um, a sort of a tax on boats. So we, if you have a keel boat, you have to provide three race committee volunteers through the year for one night. And if you're a dinghy, you have to provide two. You'll either be uh, on the race committee boat helping to run the race or on the mark boat putting the anchors in and uh, setting up the marks of the course. So that's so like the basics for running a race, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes too. So in terms of um, scoring and event planning, even managing the trophies is uh, quite a big job. And at regattas, there's all sorts of work needed from registration and helping out with uh, refreshments and sponsorship, regalia, all that sort of thing. And at a <coughs> slightly different level, we have uh, sort of officials that run the races so club judges, club race officers, assistant race officers. And uh, we have a, a program to get through Sail Canada to get these people trained to the right level. Uh, we have an organization called RCs R Us here at Nepean that you can sign up to. Debbie Weinstein is the person to talk to. And they can get you started on that sort of uh, volunteer activity. OK, so I'm going to give my voice a race, voice a rest, and hand over to Leo. Okay, so the first thing you need to do before you get out on the water is register to race. And let's just, a show of hands, how many people have already registered to race this year? One, two, three, four, five, oh, not very many. <laughs> so how easy was it to register to race? Corey, I'm gonna pick on you. How easy was it to register this year? Why was it so easy? <laughs> Why? Why do you have to register to race? Does anybody know? There you go. There you go. So it's a really uh, important but uh, small p p piece of the puzzle. I'm not going to talk about the PERF certificate because that's a whole other non-dingy thing that I don't know about. <laughs> okay, and Trevor Whitehouse, I think, is the, is the pro on that. No, where did I advance the slide? Okay, next one, sailing instructions. Now, have the sailing instructions been posted for 2024? No. Mid to late April. Okay, what will happen in late April? Will everybody go online and read the sailing instructions? Yes. Why is it so important to read the sailing instructions? Yeah. That's it. Why else? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Great. Corey, did you have another comment? Which course? Yeah. They do change. Sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over there. Unless you're a dinghy, then you just go to the same place over there. <laughs> uh, no, sailing instructions are awesome, very detailed. I think it's Hugh Moran who puts those together and they, it's coordinated with BYC, so really a big effort and a huge effort and it's all just, it's just great information. Um, and sometimes I print out the dinghy portion of the sailing instructions and I have them in my sailing bag so that I can refer to them or I can show them to my crew and say, remind me the start sequence because <laughs> it's, it's June and I don't remember anything from last year. <laughs> mm. 
Next one, getting ready to race. Check over your boat. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. How many more days to launch? 58? I thought it was 51. 51. <laughs> and that's this, the keel boats. The dinghies will be in there way earlier than the keel boats. <laughs> Um, right, so what are we going to do before we get ready to race? We're going to get ourselves rigged, check the sales, buy new sales. Who's buying new sales this year? Who's got new sales? All right, Scott's the guy to beat then. Awesome. Ah, that would do it. Yeah. A good tip, actually, Elizabeth told me, have a, sa a sale uh, a savings account, $100 a month. You'll never notice it's gone. And then bang, you got it, new sales. That's my plan for this year. But don't tell Dominic, because I'm going to beat him. <laughs> um, what else do we need? Yeah, definitely you want a stopwatch, compass for knowing what the wind is doing. How does a compass help you know what the wind is doing? OK, yeah, I, I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> I know there's the, the top thingy. What's that one called again? Windex. That one will tell me which direction the uh, wind is coming from, but the compass? Not on my boat. Uh, keel boat, backstay pennant. Oh, yeah, that's important. Sometimes it's a little orange flag. Then, they, uh, then you know which uh, course you're sailing on and which class you're sailing in. And safety equipment, of course. Never leave the dock without it. Um, getting ready to race. Does anybody have a special word for this? When you go out with your crew for the first time? Shake down. Yeah, it's good. You put your crew through their paces, make sure they remember all the words, which side's starboard, which side's port. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Attach the missing, find the missing strings. Yeah, it's an important uh, and lovely part of the process. Uh, I'm not going to go through all those terms. You guys know what they are. That's it. That's my four slides. Okay. Thanks for resting my voice, Sarah. And yeah, getting ready to race. So, rules. We talked about rules before. So, it seems like uh, us humans can't have fun without rules. So, for racing, our rules are the oops, racing rules of sailing. I keep doing that. Go away. There we go. The racing rules of sailing, this impressive looking document in the middle of all this mess. So what are they? Um, well, they're very closely based on the collision regs, which all you people who already sail, who even if you don't race, will know very well. So they're not that different, except in some of the details. Um, and they cover all aspects of racing, including how to run a race, how to um, set up a race course, all that sort of thing. But the thing I'll just talk briefly about, because if you haven't raced before, it's something you should know, is that some of the basic rules. And in the racing rules of sailing, they break them down to these four types of categories. So you've got boats that are on opposite tacks. You've got a situation where boats are on the same tack but overlapped. Situation where they're on the same tack but not overlapped. And you have a boat that are actually tacking. So I'm going to go through these not as trying to teach anyone anything, but just to show you that once you understand, these are very similar to anything, the same rules you will use when you're actually out there just cruising and not racing. So first one, which boat has to keep clear of which boat here? Blue will keep clear. Anyone else, anyone disagree with that? Yeah, and the reason is that blue is with the wind coming down the kit picture from the top there. Blue is the port tag boat and yellow is starboard. So if they carry on their, their way, they will meet. This is what we're trying to avoid, is boats meeting. So he can, he can tack away like that and oops, keep clear of the other boat. The yellow boat, although he does not have to say anything. 
<coughs> but yeah, without getting technical, yellow boat has the right just to stay on his course. And the blue guy has, to, has all the onus is on the blue guy here. <clears throat> That's right. But the key is the yellow boat, the, the right-of-way boat can sh continue on their way without having to change course. If the blue boat tacks too close to him here and he has to zigzag around him, then that's a problem. Uh, the other thing the blue boat can do if he doesn't want to go this way up the course, he can just sail behind the other boat. Just bear away and sail behind. So, well, if they don't see you, yes, yeah, yeah, but it's not an obligation, no. So, second rule, so that's, that's everyone understands the port starboard rule, basically. It's the same in racing. Second rule is on the boats on the same tag overlapped. So the first question you might have is what does overlap mean? And oops, push my button here. So overlap means if the second boat is in front of any anywhere in front of this line which goes across the transom of, of the, uh, the leeward boat. So we have the wind here. This is a windward boat. And his bow is over this line. So he is overlapped. And that means that if he continues on his course, which is going to bring him to a point where boats will meet, he's in trouble. He needs to keep clear. So it doesn't just mean not to touch him, but he has to keep clear means that this boat can also has to have the right to be able to change course. So if he gets too close, this boat can't, the blue boat can't swing his stern around to bear away. That's also a problem. So the yellow boat has to either head up to get out of the way or tack away if he can't sail closer than that. This, this is a very good diagram of me and Shalhar and Blue Zulu on a Thursday night. <laughs> and OK, second, the second condition, we've got the boat going upwind and the boat coming downwind. This is the windward leeward rule that we know from cruising, and it, but in this case, it's the same thing because they're overlapped. This boat is clearly in front of this, is across this line. And so the same thing applies. The, the blue boat that's overlapped has to get out of the way, even if it's going in the opposite direction. Boats on the same tack that are not overlapped. So here is my bright yellow boat going downwind peacefully, slowly, like a CNC does, straight downwind. And there's one of those fast J-boat things with an asymmetrical spinnaker coming across the course at high speed, aiming right at me. What do I do? I probably yell, keep clear. Because he's clear as of me. He's not past this line. And he has to keep clear of the boat ahead, which is me. So he can either and should head up and go around the back of me. Or he could bear away and come down beside me. But it's up to him. Usually they would go behind my stern. And the last rule, pretty simple one. Um, this guy's a spectator. I'm not quite sure why he's there. But if I've got a boat that's, he's, he's there to watch the fun. If I've got a boat that's, he's, he's a leeward boat. He's also on starboard tack. So he's right away for two reasons. If he comes up to tack, even when he's, he's facing right into the wind, he's still on starboard tack. But as soon as he does this, this rule says he's tacking and he hasn't got onto his other tack yet, he is a keep clear boat. Now, realistically, a boat that's tacking isn't really going anywhere. It's just turning. So he can't keep clear of anyone. So really, because he doesn't have any rights until he gets back into this position, really, this rule really says don't tack in front of anyone. It's as simple as that, which is pretty much what you wouldn't do if you were cruising either. So those are the four basic rules. And then the other rules sort of amend those and add to those. There's rules that stop the right-of-way boat doing bad things. There's rules that marks because you get a lot of boats in a close space there that sort that out. And there's rules that stop boats from being forced into an obstruction like a breakwater, which would be a bad thing. But really, there's nothing, there's nothing nonsensical about these rules. They all make a lot of sense once you read through them. And if you remember, they start off the basic rules are the same as we're all used to from sailing since we started. OK. So the next section, we'll, we'll move quickly on to the practice and learning opportunities. Uh, yes, you learn something every race. That's one of the joys of racing. 
is that every race is different, and you always can learn something from it. But uh, our esteemed fleet captain a few years ago put together a, a, a more formal program of training for both volunteers and racers to help keep um, things alive in the fleet, to help keep a flow of volunteers and experts, as well as keeping trying to increase the, uh, the skill level in our sailors as well, or give them the opportunity to do so. So for volunteers, we've, got, we've already had an emergency first aid course. We've already had the club judge course. Um, we've got some Ontario Sailing Association courses, Ontario Sailing Assistant Race Officer and Club Race Officer courses, and the Mark Set course. So these are run by Ontario Sailing. They're being run here, if you're interested in this sort of thing. And these would mostly be for existing races, I would think. You can sign up for these, and uh, I think Dominic will refund you for the cost. It's not very much, anyway. And then later in the season, we have uh, powerboat familiarization. So for people that volunteer um, for regattas and so on, this teaches you how to get into the powerboat, take it out of the harbor, bring it back in one piece, and put it away safely so that the next person can use it. And on the June the 15th, we got a rescue and safety boat handling course. This is more so that um, people who are familiar with the power boats can actually help people that get into trouble. Uh, so for example, you might learn how to uh, help a catamaran get upright without breaking his mast or tow a dinghy back into harbor without swamping him and sinking him. So that's a good course to do if you're out there on the water in the, the boats. For the races this year, we have um, still one, s one session of the virtual race practice, which is an online, anyone can join in, a group uh, race that goes on. Next one's on April 2nd. On April 6th, we've got the North U Sail Trim and Boat Speed Seminar, which is being held here. Uh, the early bird registration for that is over, but uh, I think we, the PN members at least, because we're hosting it, will get a 15% discount up until the start date. On May 17th, 24th, and 31st, we have keelboat race practice, uh, which I'll talk about later. And then on also in May, we have dinghy race practice, which is new this year, which Leonora is, is running. And then also for the dinghies, we have two courses, one in July and one in August, four week course for dinghy skills improvement, just to help dinghy sailors become better dinghy sailors. And with that, I think I hand over to you. Okay, so as I said, I've only been sailing about three years. So when I did the Can Sail 2 course, I then pretty much blindly bought an albacore because I just loved it so much. And as I've learned, the only way to get better is time on the water, which is why I've started organizing <laughs> training courses for other people and myself so that I can participate, get time on the water, and get like repetition, repetition, repetition so that I, I get to be a better sailor. Um, these pictures are uh, actually the one on the right. That was like our first ever outing in the albacore. So that was pretty fun. That's my son there. And then this is a, an old laser we've got at the cottage and uh, with my daughter and a friend. Um, th that picture is actually not very truthful because my daughter was the one who was helming most of the time and I was just <laughs> the weight <laughs> keep it, trying to keep the boat flat. Um, yeah, so with that, next one, yeah. So with racing, so my kids have all learned to sail. They've got their four, five, and I saw, like Tony mentioned, how much it helps them become like more confident, more skilled. They're outside all the time. They're being physical. And I was going along as a volunteer helping on safety boat and stuff like that, which was fun and great and being part of the community. But really what I wanted to learn was I wanted to learn how to actually sail and race. And just seeing how much confidence it gave my kids and like doing knots and like 3D stuff, stuff you don't learn in school, right? So summer's just been a great opportunity for them uh, to have this very physical experience, but also, like Tony mentioned, like a very tough mental experience 
in all sorts of conditions. I've got to say, this here is my 13-year-old. Uh, Look at her. She's helming. She's a rock star. Yeah, she's going to be on the race team again this summer. So I'm just so proud of her, and we're just so fortunate that we, uh, we got her in, into sailing. I'm just trying to keep up. I've only got level two. <laughs> Um, oh, uh, so here we are at Fanfare uh, a couple years ago. So this is an albacore. As you can see, there's a skipper and a crew person. And um, one of the things that uh, Mike's been running for a couple of years now is the keelboat uh, race practice. And really what it is, it's about practicing starting. And so I think it was last fall, I said, oh, how come dinghies don't have that? And Mike said, why don't you organize it? So I am organizing it. And really, it's an opportunity for anybody uh, to come out in a dinghy. Ideally, it's a bring your own dinghy kind of situation. And it's practicing those starts. And we've got volunteers from the dinghy yard who are going to help set us up. And um, yeah practice starting because that's uh, such a real important part of every race if you can start well then your race is uh, already looking much better than if you're starting at the back so that's uh, a new program that we're going to start uh, may 31st will be the first one and uh, yeah it's going to be free but bring your own dinghy uh, is the model right now And then, so last year, we ran eight uh, dinghy skills uh, courses. So these are held on Fridays. Oh, the dinghy starts are also going to be on Fridays. Uh, so as we heard, there's racing pretty much every other night of the week. So Fridays were the one night of the week that were available. And so this one, again, is about getting those adult learners who have, say, they've passed their can sail too, but they want more time on the water. And so these are held mostly in the 420 boats, which are the kid boats that the kids race in. And we haven't got registration up yet. That'll be up by May. Uh, there will be volunteers assisting. And if there's any experienced racers in the crowd, we'll be looking for volunteers with that. Uh, so last year, I think we were about eight uh, 420 boats, plus um, volunteers who came out in their dinghies. So it was like one or two albacores. Um, yeah, and then it's an opportunity. You can like climb in with a volunteer and you can mix it up. Anyway, it's just like another avenue to get for adults to get more time on the water uh, in dinghies. Um, yeah, so we're going to have two sessions this year, July 5th to 26th and August 9th to 30th. So Fridays, 5.30 to 8.30 and then come up for a beer afterwards. So that's the plan. And last slide. Yeah, so back to uh, the community aspect. It's been a really important part of sailing here for me, and I hope that it is for you as well. Uh, the other thing that hasn't really come up yet um, is the whole women's sailing. Like, I'm really trying to promote more female sailors. And if you come and see me after the presentation, I'll take your email. And there is a, we've got an email list uh, for uh, women who sail. And uh, we're hoping to host um, like a little event later on this spring before the uh, sailing season starts. So if you want to be added to that list, we'd uh, love to have you. Uh, and I think, I think I'm going to just leave it there. Thank you. Dinghy skills, last year was $100. Uh, last year, dinghy skills training was $100 per boat. So this year, I think we're going to register per person rather than per boat. So then we can like mix and match, and you don't have to bring a crew with you. So it's for so it's be four evenings uh, for about fifty dollars. But I I'm trying to confirm that with Sean because it's they're his boats. Okay. Okay. So as Leo said, uh, we've been running keelboat race practice for about six years now. Although there were interruptions due to floods, COVID, and other unfortunate events but uh, the purpose is yeah to give a chance for people who want to maybe the first time or want to practice again uh, try to a little race course a windward leeward course how most of the races set up you sail straight into the wind go around the buoy and come back and in a sort of environment where there's no one else you're not competing against one there's no winners here it's a practice it's not a race 
and on a good evening um, with a decent wind we try and get six starts in so people can do six starts and six quick loops so it's very good practice and uh, for even for experienced crews it gives them the chance to experiment or get their crew tuned up or get their skipper tuned up and it's also a good opportunity for the bosuns to run some races before the regatta season starts in, in earnest. So they get to run like uh, 18 races for practice before they, they start for real. So this is, uh, that's the idea. And as Leo also mentioned, the big part of it is to try and take away the the, the worries people have about starting. Starting is a kind of a, a hect the most hectic time on the race course probably, a lot of boats milling around, not having anywhere particularly to go until the race starts. Um, it really helps if you know how what the starting sequence is before you go out for the first time. And so you should know that most of the races, uh, it's a five minute sequence and it, the, the sequence is signaled by flag. So you have a chance to get ready for the start. Um, by observing these flags. There are other sig flags used to signal recalls and change the course, all sorts of other things that can happen. Uh, you can buy a sticky with all those flags on it and stick it somewhere on your boat so that if you don't know what it is, you say, well, what's green and red dots mean? Oh yeah, okay, go home, right, got it. Um, so just to give you a quick, quick rundown if you're not familiar, we have before the start sequence, the race committee boat will have a flag on it showing it's, it's ready, it's anchored, hopefully not drifting around. And there's a course flag. In this case, it's, it's the T flag. That's that color. And uh, each time the flag changes, there's a sound signal made. Um, but the actual timing is determined by the flags, not the sound signal. So five minutes before the start, the class flag goes up. So here I've got a number one flag. And then four minutes, there's a preparatory flag goes up. So if you miss the, the five minute, you can get your timing off the four minutes. Just change your countdown to four minutes. And then one minute before the start, that flag goes down. And then at the start, the class flag is lowered and everyone starts to cross the start line. And it's as simple as that. Just a couple of flags and that's the order they're in. And if you know that, it, at least you'll know what everyone is doing when they all start heading towards the start line. Oh, yes, yeah, because the prep flag went down. They're going to start in a minute. And that helps reduce some of the confusion. And that's pretty much the end of our 101 introduction from, from the PN and BY, the organized, the stuff that's organized by the clubs. So I'm going to ask Tony to let us to come in and tell us now about a race which he's organized himself. It's completely completely different. And now for something completely different. I can say it. I've always wanted to say that. And now for something completely different. Great minds think alike because if you hear this out on the course someday. <laughs> So I want you to first understand the conception of rust, which is uh, apparently unique in the entire world, but works very well. So this is what it stands for, and this is really important. Retired and unemployed sailor's trophy. So what that means was, uh, well, I'll tell you that in a second. This is our seventh season, and the fleet has been expanding continually every, continuously every year. It is now the largest racing fleet out here, except for the special regattas, which are international or national. But on a weekly or daily, you know, weekly basis, it's the largest fleet by far. It's, uh, it's definitely a lot of fun. You can choose to what to compare it with. And a very friendly social group. And uh, I'll mention more about how we get together as a social group. So I'm going to cover a number of things here. Overview description of the series the main points of the SI, the voyage, the handicapping system, which is totally different from what you've already been told, 
how the rabbit start works, so you have an idea of that, which is much less stressful than a regular race start. Uh, a particular point for BYC is the narrow channel, small boat, big boat interaction. I don't know if you have that problem here with juniors and dinghies and then keel boats passing them and all that kind of stuff. It's just something to bear in mind and it's in the SI. Uh, how we abandon races, which does happen from time to time, and how you finish and score. And aid memoir, like was mentioned earlier, a uh, very good idea to cut out or photocopy two or three of the pages and stick them in plastic and have them in your boat. Uh, once you've done it a few times, it'll be no problem, but uh, the first few times you might get confused. And then the famous Rust Cup trophy, which you'll see later on. So, conception of the race. Uh, this is important how the whole thing was designed. So I just want to mention that uh, it was invented in here by me walking around. And I was currently racing, and I, in the afternoons I would meet all these obviously retired skippers, male and female, wandering around with nothing to do. So I'd say, what have you been doing? They said, well, I was working on the boat. Are you racing tonight? No, I don't do that anymore, because these were people in their 60s and 70s, and they said, I did that for years. I'm not doing it. So what are you going to do now? Well, I'm going to go to the club and have a beer. So I thought, well, these people are all racers. They've all got boats, and they've got nothing to do. So I thought, there's a gap here somewhere. Then about a week later, I was out racing or sailing by myself in a blue nose, which is a small keel boat, and I met a guy in a Finn dinghy. And he were, we were already friends. A young guy in a finger dinghy, he's probably like 20 years old. And there's me, you know, 67. He just yells over and say, hey, want to race? And I said, sure. Where? That mark there, then that mark there, and then come back here. So we did. And I thought, why can't that happen in real life? Well, dinghies don't have the same handicap system, blah, 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 so it's physically impossible. There is no system to accommodate it. So that's what I created, a system where a shark can sail against a fin dinghy and sail against a 50-foot keel boat and they can all be in the same race and they can all get handicapped fairly and compete directly against each other, which is why it's the biggest fleet, because everybody can join in. So the factors which made it more popular is the whole thing is run by volunteers. Uh, there's no staff whatsoever to do anything. The marks are already there. There's no race committee. Um, the marks are laid by volunteers for the whole season and uh, we run socials and various other things. It's all like we bring our own food, we have potlucks, we don't require any support from the club whatsoever. And that makes it uh, more enjoyable because the volunteers are the people you're actually racing with and you know it's very much a team spirit thing. Uh, the handicap, that's National Handicap for Cruisers, that's what the NHC stands for. It was invented by the Royal Yachting Association, I want to guess like maybe 15 or longer years ago. It's been used for racing for cruisers and the p point about that is most cruisers are not a class boat everyone is different somebody's got a special for sale somebody's got a special tall mast somebody's got something else you take some basic specs off them and you can handicap them and they can have a race and and race fairly so that concept is what i adopted um, regu regular social gatherings no club required resources makes it uh, very easy you know no burden on the club whatsoever so in the SI, which is on the BYC website, you're going to have it on your website, I think, or the link. You, you definitely need to read up on it because it is not like a typical race. It's open to everybody and everything, as I mentioned. It does follow the racing rules of sailing. So once you've learned those, there's a few exceptions, very small exceptions, like uh, you saw the countdown of the signals and the flags. That doesn't apply. So. There's signals of two blasts and three blasts, which means postponement and abandonment in a normal race. In this one, it means two minutes and three minutes. So it's a five minute, four, three, two, one countdown, which makes it very simple for people too. They don't have to read flags. They just hear four and they look at their watch and say four minutes to go. So it is, there are minor departures and they're all pointed out in the SIs. So I've already mentioned that. Zero resource, I've mentioned that. This may be a problem for you. In BYC, it's definitely a problem because Wednesday afternoon, the, hub, the club is jam-packed with kids in dinghies. And that's when we all head out of the harbor in the big boats. So we tell the big boats, you don't have right away. You let the kids go where they want. Uh, abandonment, well, essentially the thing is once the race has started, there's no one in charge. Okay? The person who started the race is the rabbit boat, becomes another racer. So then you're pretty much left to your own devices. 
if the rabbit boat sees a monster storm coming unexpectedly, they might try and pass the word by VHF and say, we're packing it in, we recommend you do. But every skipper can make their own decision, and that's what the racing rules say. It's your call. Uh, start areas, I'll mention that with the chart later on, but uh, they're almost always at PQRS, so this end of the lake. So you know you don't have to sail far. If you happen to be late and you're going over to the far side to get to Q Mark on the Quebec shore, you can get in the radio and say, hey, wait for me, and you'll be waited for, okay? We've done it many times. Somebody's out there, had a problem, and they say, we're coming, or we can see them coming. We just announced 10 minute delay, and nobody complains about it. So that's what I say. We want to get everybody who can get there going. The rabbit start I'm going to talk about, the Olympic circle is what we use, and any others available. Uh, the courses are not preset, so that's part of the fun is nobody knows where they're going to go when they get out there. They don't know how long the course is and which way it's going to go around, but it really does work. So that's part of the thrill for some of them. And you finish record yourself uh, to the Rust Cup score, it's all in the SI. Uh, it's a very generous race series, so in a good year we might have 19 races. You can drop six or seven of those. So you can not even show up seven times and still win, basically which is nice. And that's because it includes the unemployed, which is people who are otherwise maybe working, but they've taken the summer, you know, they, they, got, they can work their schedule around it, so they've got an afternoon off or something. That's like Ross Ernst did that. He was able to race for an entire season, over the, even though he was working full time, because he, he fixed his work schedule. And I'll talk briefly about the handicap and prices and awards. That's everything I'm going to cover. So. There's the yellow circle, you're all familiar with that. And here's the, uh, the three start areas, depending on, that covers every wind direction possible, north, south, east, west. You can figure it out as soon as you go up and say, oh, it's a south wind. Well, then we're gonna be down here. So you know you're gonna have to sail across the lake. Now, don't, don't let the next slide blow your mind, but wait for it. So. What this is really, there's only one point being made here, is the course could be any possible shape. And the other point is, you don't know whether you're going port or starboard around because both are allowed in this race series. So normal racing, it's port around every mark. In this race, to make a good course shape, you can go port or starboard, okay? And I think I have a pointer somewhere. In this case, the, uh, here's the BYC Flagstaff, there's S Mark, which is normally where almost all starts occur here. So there's the actual start line that day, and the first mark is at P, so obviously that's a starboard rounding, not a port rounding, because the next mark is C up here. And the easy thing to think about is this course is a string, and that's exactly the same as the racing rules say. If you can pull a string around all the marks, then you've done the course. So the only question comes where maybe a mark here, you might say, I'm going to go this way around instead of this way around. Well, if you pull the string, one of them is looping the mark and the other one is just going around it. That's been a problem for some racers. So we end up with two boats coming from port and starboard at the mark saying, I'm going around the mark the right way. It's easily resolved by which is the shortest, easiest way. Uh, the handicapping, well, that's my personal opinion at the top biased and inaccurate. NHC is run by an algorithm. There's no politics involved. And over six years of racing, the people that win are the best racers by far. They're not handicapped for being you know, too good and being slowed down because it's an algorithm. It adjusts over time, which I'm about to show you. It's being tested over thousands of data points. Anything and anyone can compete in any configuration. You just need to tell the scorer what you're doing and what kind of boat you've got and any modifications. And I just mentioned that, local experience works the best racers. Now, this might be a little hard to figure out, but it's basically 10 boats, and it shows here's the first race, and you can see this is what happens to the handicap over time. If the last boat or the first boat comes first every time, separated by one minute, and you've got all 10 of them, you have this parabolic kind of curve. But after about five races, it's almost infinitesimal, the changes. So the algorithm looks at you and says, I figure out this is how fast your boat is going, but you're coming first in every race. 
So normally that wouldn't be right, so it slows you down a bit, a bit, a bit. And then after five races, you're still coming first. It says, okay, you're a good racer. I'm leaving you alone. Same with the last boat. You get helped, 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 helped. And then it says, you don't know how to race. So I'm not helping you anymore. <laughs> or no, you're not a skilled sailor yet. So it leaves you alone. And it, it really works well. Like I said, the, the top people who come in, we've got some world champions who race there, national champions, North American champions, they're in the top five boats. And you know, they deserve it. So next one is a similar graph done by uh, Elizabeth Patty here, a member, one of your members who's racing in the NHC for a long, well, all, almost every year. Being a scientist, she had to do it with a computer. I did it with a, you know, a felt pen, but it comes out to the same thing. A very nice, even progression of handicapping at the beginning, and then it slows and tapers off to zero, and you can see what happens over time. Now, the rabbit start. It's great for beginners. Okay, so let's say this is S mark or P mark. And the rabbit boat does a specific series of maneuvers which physically indicates the countdown to the start, five, four, three, two, one minutes, and also makes signals with a horn, five, four, three, two, one, prolonged blast. And the diagram is all very you know, clear in the, in the SI. So at this point when the, the boat is the rabbit boat, which is identified with a colorful pennant and announces themselves by VHF or hail, so you know who's doing the start, is at this point here at zero when that's the start. Sails off, close hauled in this direction, and people cross the invisible line here, which is just basically the wake of the rabbit boat. Now, the why it's good for novice racers is you can sit up here and the rabbit boat will sail up there and go past you and you can be way away from the crowd. There's often a crowd down here because they want to get across the line first. But if you know how upwind racing works, the people who started here will sail off to there and the person who starts up here crosses the line right here and basically they're absolutely equal. You know, so being across the line two and a half minutes later doesn't mean you're two and a half minutes behind because you're upwind. And normally, it's always meant to be an upwind. So we don't have downwind courses or anything like that. So are there any questions on this? Because this is something that some people don't understand. Uh, when I, especially I know there's a novice racer. I'll try to meet them before the race and say, watch for me, I will sail to you. So I just tell them, hang out here somewhere and I will sail up and then you pass under my stern and you've got a clear start. How long the line is, is basically six seconds a boat in good weather. So if you've got 10 boats, it's a minute long, however fast. But if I see that's not working, and I'm almost always the rabbit, it's not working, and there's five boats out there, I just keep sailing, because it's more important that they get a start than I tack away and say, ha ha, you, you missed the start line, now you're gonna have to, you know, come, you're gonna start two minutes late. So it's very accommodating, and all you have to do is watch the rabbit boat and listen for the sound signals. Any questions? Uh, and there, there's the table which describes the chart that you just looked at. So five, four, three, two, one, tells you what the rabbit boat is doing and the amount of time and the signal that you're gonna hear. Everybody hoists this in pretty quickly. Uh, that's what the rabbit boat looks like mostly. That's me and my blue nose with a big colored pennant. And there are three or four other boats have been the rabbit as well. So you, you're not always knowing who it is. So you want to find out who that is. And if you have any questions, sail by the rabbit boat and say, like, what's going on? My radio didn't work. Or, and you'll get it verbally. So it's very relaxed that way, not like other race committees that say, you know, we can't help you. We can't talk to you, which is what the rules say. So we've already talked about that. Race abandonment, I've already talked about. Uh, this is important to remember. Once the rabbit boat has turned and joined the race, they're just another racer. And while they, before they do that, they have right of way over all boats. So don't mess with the rabbit, okay? Because that can cause real problems, because sometimes there's a lot of uh, congested uh, maneuvering a minute before the start. So rabbit boat has right of way, and the rabbit might attempt to change or do something, but normally is unable to, and that's already been mentioned. How do you finish and score? There it is. There's a 1400 time check. That's 1400. Okay, no matter what your watch says, that's 1400. So if you're a 1401, you need to make an adjustment. 
you time your whole race. Good thing to have race cues. Does anybody have, know what race cues is? Anybody? It's a fo free phone app that works really well normally. You just turn it on before the race and it will show you your entire course and if you forget to take your time you can just play it back at home and it says oh yeah I finished at 1403 not 1404. So it's free, it's easy to use but if you do remember, you write it down, you send an email to the scorer and that's all you have to do. Uh, there's some other nice things like if you can say who's around you at the time you finished but that's not essential. But it's an honor system. You, you know, the whole race, this, this whole process is an honor system. People are trying to work it out between each other, and you report your own time. And if you cheat, there's a good chance somebody's going to notice. <laughs> if you say, I, I finished one minute before, somebody is going to say, no, no, they were behind me, and I finished it this time. That has happened, but it's usually a mistake. So that's that. Um, the SI, I've already told you, make your own aid memoir like this, just a few of the core rules, the diagram, and the, uh, the table of what's going on, and that should be good. And here's the social group I told you about. Uh, I've got about 105 or 10 people on the email list right now. Uh, we've got about 50 boats registered. And I organize a social potluck, which is everybody brings their own food and drink, and we do it on the North Shore uh, three times a year, like first race, mid-season, end season. And that was last year, uh, sorry, two, 222. That was last year, and that's nowhere near the, uh, the full fleet. That's just a tiny fraction. And I think we have, okay, lots of different events over the years. It, it shows, it gets awarded along with the official awards, because this is really like an unofficial race. It doesn't get aggregated into anything else, but the club still allows us to have our, our award given at the race uh, awards night. And there's the uh, famous cup, which is, as you can see, a colander full of holes. And this is uh, symbolic of the rust fleet, which is, it doesn't hold water anymore. It's old and rusty, and it is. It's, it looks much better here than it really is. And if you get champagne because you won, you can't drink any, because it just leaks out before you can get at it. So it's uh, supposed to be a wry symbol of uh, the fleet. And I think that's it. Any questions? So if, if there are questions, I would ask people to come and stand up to the mic. Wednesday afternoon, the time is the, f the five minutes is at 14.15, start 14.20, and a 1400 time check. So you, as long as you can get there for the start, that's it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Be there around 2 o'clock. Start, start time, start 2.15. And the race is normally an hour, whatever the wind is, because everybody wants to get back to the club and when the bar opens. <laughs> yeah, Corey? You don't need a certificate, so if you just want to race this, it's free. Uh, we calculate the handicap, or, or Kirk, who's been a handicapper for years, he does the thing. You just need to tell him, here's my boat, here's my sail number, and this is all listed in the SI. Provide him the following five pieces of information, and you're in. So you don't, you don't need to say anything after that. You just report your score, your time, and uh, you get scored. Um, you know, we will observe, I and others will observe, if you're out there, and if you don't report, quite often I'll send you an email saying, hey, I saw you were racing, you didn't report, do you want to? Okay, so it's, uh, we're helping out as best we can. Uh, to help Tony out more, we added it to the uh, NSC uh, online race registration as well. Right. So that he'll get, for those here, you can use that or you can do it directly uh, through Tony. Exactly, so if you register for racing at your club, on our forms there's just a box that says Rust, you can just tick it. But if you're registered for racing, you're registered for rust. Okay, so it's, you don't have to do any more work and it doesn't cost you anything. Okay. Oh, another? Uh, sure, I had a question about going from, from cruising to dinghies. Yep. Because I've done cruising for quite a while and I've got used to staying dry.
But I'd, I'd like the idea of the dinghy thing. So I'm less, I wonder if there's some more color people could, uh, anybody's done that, gone from cruising to, to dinghy sail, to r dinghy racing, well. and what to expect. Like, <laughs> I, when you were bringing that up, I was thinking, oh, well, yeah, the first how, thing. how cold is the water? Do I need a wetsuit? Uh, and then I'm also fairly uh, getting older and a bit stiffer. So I thought, like, it'd be great if I could do some dinghy sailing. It might improve my flexibility, but I might be biting off more than I can chew. I don't know. Well, the key thing I would say is if you're going from a keel boat to a dinghy is are you ready for capsizing? I think so. A alone. And nobody's going to be helping you. So that's what you have to think about. Worst case is turn yeah. turtle, the boat's upside down, and everybody else is racing, and nobody's coming to help you for maybe 40 minutes. A friendly bunch. Depends. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, it was mentioned before, what can I do? What can I do to get ready for racing? In the wintertime, what I did was I read and studied tactics, strategy, all the best writers that were out there about, you know, how to race. And then I did my homework sitting on an upturned chair doing hiking because I was racing in dinghies where you were hiking all the time. So I spent three years doing my high school homework, you know, in a, with a hiking strap on a, on a breakfast table chair every night. And so I was, I was fit. So I was fitter than almost everybody else when we went out racing in a strong wind the next season. I could hike out, you know, for hours and studied the tactics. Because there's a lot of really good books out there, really simple, and the stuff online shows you, you know, how to take advantage of this rule or how to avoid this problem at a mark. So that's something you can do in the wintertime that's very productive. Any other questions? All right, thanks very much. So again, I'd like to express our thanks to uh, Mike, uh, Leo, and Tony. Uh, we have a small gift for you here uh, for later when, when we're all done. Um, a reminder that next week, uh, the, the talk is on uh, a voyage of discovery, Granada to Newfoundland with Pete and Antonio Antoniti and crew. Um, and thanks everybody for showing up tonight. It's a good crew and a good crowd. And thanks and hope to see you next week. Good night.